Um, so the, top, the topic here is uh, exclusive study on multi-rotor aerodynamic interactions. Uh, before I actually get into this topic, uh, I'll first go and uh, give you a background of what is rotorcraft and uh, like basics into like more of some general aerospace terms uh, in the, in atmosphere flight and uh, other definitions. I'll briefly talk about the laboratory which I work in, and then we'll go on to my specific research. So, uh, background on rotorcraft. If we classify all the kinds of uh, in atmosphere aircrafts, there are these four kinds of aircrafts you have seen. CPO, which is commercial takeoff and lift, uh, there are takeoff and landing aircrafts, which you might have seen are uh, most of the passenger jets and few of fighter jets, the one of which helped me be here in whatever 24 hours at the city. Um, these are like conventions, so they take a significant part of runway to take off and land. And uh, they are good for range, good for speed. The other, pla uh, other classification is short takeoff and landing. So these aircrafts take like only a fraction of what the conversion aircrafts take for takeoff and landing. One of it is, as you can see, this uh, not so nice looking aircraft. Well, but the thing is, uh, it has it is equipped with very high lift devices, due to which uh, even by like, gaining a very small of speed, it is able to generate enough lift to take off within like a few meters of runway. The other one, the other way of uh, doing short takeoffs is by thrust vector, and in this case, the the thrust due to the jet is vectored to give it an extra push to take off in very short distances. Here is a very short clip of video. Uh, all it's trying to show is like within like by the time this aircraft reaches somewhere here, it is uh, off the ground. And this kind of aircrafts are useful when you have very short landings uh, takeoff strip, uh, strip, and that is usually when you are in mountainous areas where it's difficult to uh, have launch. Or uh, also for fight aircrafts, it's useful when like uh, you're designing. For takeoff at large, short distance, so that if the enemy uh, bombs your uh, landing strip, then you're still able to uh, use your aircraft. Otherwise, all of them are useful. Next one is short takeoff and vertical landing. So, often the challenge is to get off the ground, while landing is relatively easier to do. So, some of the aircrafts uh, like, do a brief run and then take off, but while landing, they will just vertically. They are with our critical involved, and um, these are the two like brief examples from two different uh, areas. So one of them is actually using thrust vectoring to do short takeoff, uh, and the other one is a third rotor configuration, which like, uh, it, it takes some it can run on runway and then it will just build up its uh, rotors to generate uh, uh, cross topics. So in these cases, what happens is the main wing actually generates some uh, component of its lift, and the rest is balanced by the rotor here and engine vector interest in this problem. So this is the previous one. And I don't have the video for the video. So basically, uh, this video actually showed uh, that this like, this photograph was taken off very short distance, and this is the F thirty five uh, daily version, and it kind of hovers forward and uh, then dips down to like that. <coughs> then we come to vertical takeoff and landing, which is where we are finally ready. So here, uh, the takeoff and landing both are uh, directly. Without the use of the rotor. Again, uh, you can still use F 35 or these kind of fight aircrafts for this configuration. But uh, the, the limitation is that if you are trying to take off vertically, then your payload capacity or 
uh, drops down significantly. So if your mission is very short and uh, you do not need much fuel or do not need many missiles or whatever, you can still use the the ones which I showed here. This aircraft, which I should for short takeoff and landings, this can be used as vertical takeoff also with the limitation. And the other ones, of course, helicopters and things like that. So, this vertical takeoff and landing, like, so I came from all kinds of aircrafts to this particular vertical takeoff and landing aircraft because I want to talk about rotor plus. And rotor plus is a subset of vertical takeoff and landing class of aircrafts. And here, the difference is that we are not really generating thrust by vector data, generating by vector thrust for jet engine, but it's mostly by rotating wings. And this for uh, sake of examples, I have put here a conventional helicopter, a chill, which is a tandem rotor helicopter, and the field rotor, which I showed a few slides ago. So all of these are in. Uh, are uh, coming with a uh, definition of rotorcraft. It's not necessary that rotorcraft has to be pretty well tuned. Like it can, so for example, this field rotor can actually also take off using the full runway length if, it's, if, that, if, uh, if it has a runway and uh, if it needs to carry a lot of But uh, for a the helicopter, it cannot use runway because it does not have the landing gear equipped for that. So, merits and demerits of rotorcraft. Well, some of the merits are coming come directly from the fact that these things can power and can take off vertically. So, of course, we need a front wings, which means that like, it can land on almost anywhere, like in movies, on uh, helipads or on the stuff. It is very useful for like, rescue, firefighting, ambulance. All this you cannot do with fixed wing engines. So, This is not very uh, intuitive. So, this is not very good, but it's safe in case of the jet fuel. You would think that a uh, helicopter would just drop down like a uh, like stone if it's engine fuel, but it's not fuel. Really so, once its engine fails, uh, it will uh, go into auto rotation mode. And if it, uh, like Panasonic can train to like uh, send it safely. Like maybe the landing gears would be damaged, but still you would be safe if you if you're in the helicopter. You won't be a runway to land. You can still land almost anywhere, like if it is if that's enough to land. So it is safer than a normal uh, fixed wing aircraft to be in the helicopter if, it, if they can fix. But the demerits are that you cannot really travel intercontinental or even from inter state using uh, the park because of its very limited range. And these are because of many losses and uh, inefficiencies because of the core concept that most of the lift is generated by this rotating thing instead of uh, it being generated as a byproduct of moving forward. Speed is also a limitation which I'll talk slightly more about when I go to what our uh, what is such that is, but I'll show you that shortly. Sure. Noise is an issue because now we are so in fixed wing aircrafts, the whole wing is actually traveling at a given speed and that is helping it the In rotorcraft, the speed of a section of a plane is depend on where it is located, located. So at the tip, you have very high speed and at the root, you have almost low speed. So the thrust generated, so uh, for a given required thrust, or like if your tip speed has to be significant and because of that, it is often times uh, acting in transonic or like marginal supersonic. Now, any kind of air disturbance would cause that transonic thing to move into like shift briefly into uh, supersonic flow and would cause shock waves and you know, uh, like associated noises. Other thing is when helicopter is actually descending, the wake due to the helicopter itself uh, collides with the tip of the rotor blades and that also. Is a very major cause of uh, helicopter noise. And you might or might not have noticed that helicopters only like sometimes hear that thud, 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 like sound and then they go quiet and then they come in. It's pretty unstable. Because of the uh, shockwaves, and most of 
most of it is because the rotor is looking at like around 300, 400 RPM of index 500 RPM. And uh, many of the loads on the rotor blade are like 2 to 3 times, like they cycle at a frequency of 2 to 3 times the rate of uh, rotation. So you have all different kinds of harmonics which are in, um, on the rotor blades and hence which also travel through to your fuselage. So the ride on the helicopter is not very comfortable as it is compared to our fuselage. Maintenance, like because everything is shaking, and also the helicopter, helicopters are very complex machines. machines. The squash mechanism, the way the rotor actually, there are too many links and small parts associated with that. So maintenance is always mentioned like some attack helicopter, like would, for one hour of flight, it actually requires maintenance of two hours. So it depends on what it is, but. That's the level of like how wide is very expensive to fly. Difficult to fly. The controls of a helicopter are very really covered. So, for example, if you want to lift, like if you are uh, lift off from some and you are trying to lift it higher, uh, and I'll say, um, and if you like, uh, so only way to do that is by pitching up your blades. So, I do say this is this I do say that then you get a whole lift and. A byproduct of that is you are also jumping more top on the roof. Now, if, you're just, if a pilot just tries to increase the pitch control for increasing, as for, like, say, raising its height out, it is also causing increased top, which is, has to be balanced by the tail rotor. So the pilot has to actively also control the tail rotor speed or actually the pitch to counter the extra top due to the change in. So the pilot has to be very active and he has to look at many things simultaneously to something to do something as simple as just raise down. And reliability. So um, you will see many accidents actually happening in the companies compared to the fixed week because parts feel very easy, things are vibrating and it's working now, but next flight it won't be working. Um, I think yesterday itself uh, in Maharashtra, the chief ministers crash and was like a, a small gust can actually cause like many problems and if pilot is not uh, good enough uh, it's difficult to move. So what are the current research openings like or what are what are things happening with this field right now? Like unlike the fixed wing feed uh, this field is not uh, like very far from being saturated. So if you see not many new things are happening in terms of tech parts they are still looking like the same aircrafts. There are few concepts, but they're still like, uh, they, they have been known for a while. Here, people are trying for uh, cycle, uh, cycle rotors, which are not covered, but like, they could be different animals. Coaxial rotor, which means like, the two rotors rotating double multiple aircraft in opposite directions, so that you do not need a tail rotor, and they have, uh, they have different benefits. Uh, probably the top later, or we ask me. And yeah, please feel free to ask me any questions many times. Field uh, tutor, which I showed you uh, some time ago. Micro, I have MAVs, which is micro air vehicles, so which are like very small size uh, aircrafts, which they are planning, they are, people are developing for surveillance, uh, so peaceful, so not, not so peaceful purposes. Multi rotor are, <coughs> so one example is tandem, but there are other like, you have, you have seen drones, and I think one of them was used for filming IAPS campus. I used to see it all the on Facebook. <coughs> one minute simulation. So there's a lot of work happening on the CFD side also. Uh, doing CFD like photo CFD is kind of difficult on photograph because it is a rotating machine. So unless you remesh every instant in time, you are not really doing full of CFD. People are, uh, really are, uh, people are also trying to develop inflow models, big models, so that uh, you don't have to really do the whole same thing to understand it. Uh, all of these are still just models and they are uh, empirical in nature. So nobody knows for sure what exactly is happening. Only you do some experiments, you see that if you weigh this parameter with this value, you see results which match expert values good enough, then they just use it for things which are similar, like similar designs or. Uh, 
there is a lot of working happening in fly by wire, like as I told you, uh, piloting any kind of aircraft is very difficult. So, to reduce pilot load, um, people are trying to apply different technologies, many things taken over by computer itself instead of pilot load to do all the way to things. People also find autonomous vehicles, which is like if, if you see it's once you have the controls of the helicopter figured out, then it is actually easier to fly than to have autonomous vehicle on board. So that's like a small amount of issue. It's mostly like um, image processing to know what is, where you are and other kind of things. Acoustics, as I told, the helicopters are very noisy, and if you are in some cold position, uh, you can think twice if you want to take a helicopter or anything like that. I know elasticity, as you suspect that these huge blades, like blades are spanning a few, few meters, and they are uh, rotating at such RPM, and they have all these different particle loads, they would uh, get the specs and do many modes of like, vibrations. So, elasticity is a big concern there, and there are human factors saying that if human is giving so, so much vibrations and has to look for so many things, so. Many of the accidents actually happen because of humans. But if you think that it's not just humans, but because of the it's like it's so difficult to find. It's very easy for a person to miss a few things. So all of these are like done research. These are these are extensive lips, but this is like most important things happening these things. Next I'm going to come briefly into where I work. And so that starts with uh Jordan Technology is pretty good. That's after the American Civil War, that's from like 1840. It's a huge school, like 25,000 students, the six colleges, of which we are I'm considered on the college of engineering. And aerospace engineering school is part of College of Engineering, and it's a significantly big school. And it's currently doing that, it's like the first few years of the year, second two years. As significant uh, research in vertical like uh, research and access, and it, which gives me a copy of uh, another video. Uh, so, the so lab I'm working my advisor is uh, Professor Narayan Kumar, and uh, SCCP is um, it's a big size, like low speed, um, close loop vehicle. So, close loop actually saves a lot of energy. Like if you are kind of giving kinetic energy to air to go through same thing when you see this section that uh, and this thing can go to like 70 miles per hour, which is I don't know how much it can you know calculus or something. But yeah, uh, so this lab uh, this place has been around since 1930s. And the aerospace department actually was built around uh, and these are some of the tools which Use for different diagnosis. So, smoke for visualization, as you suspect, you have a model, you like, put some uh, smoke source, maybe you post it, and then you look for this one. But it is just quantitative. If you want to be more quantitative, then you do particle image classification, which like, uh, I'll talk to, I'll talk about that more a little bit, or maybe just like, drop it. Yes. So, you see the float, and then you take photograph of the location where you uh, want to. Find velocity and that uh, you take two photographs in a fraction of like few milliseconds or microseconds. And if you track the particle, like okay, this uh, particle was here at this frame and it's now here at the frame two, then you know that this was a velocity. So you do that for full frame and you have to illuminate using a laser sheet and you have to use um, ice cameras. So there are different versions that you can do 2D, 3D, it's, you get 3D people of velocities and a plane of, um, in, in a sheet of, like, uh, feet, uh, in feet of meters. And tomography means you have, like, a block of, like, a jet full of, uh, like, you get three <coughs> velocity, uh, three components of velocity in three dimensions. Space. It's not just a shock. Uh, Major depth of velocity is, a different variant where you um, can find velocity at a given point at very high rate, like a few thousands of samples per second. Hot wire is the same thing, but our laser velocity is non-inclusive, but 
like how dominant are the commutative effects compared to viscous effects. So here we actually find, uh, here we define tip Reynolds input based on the tip speed of the input. So here we get is the tip Reynolds input, which can easily be the RPM times the radius of the input. C is the bottleneck of the input at that location. Now uh, U is dynamic viscosity, and rho is the density of the fluid. In this case, we get tip vertex. So when any uh, aircraft is generating uh, all the aircrafts, all the screens are actually finite in length. So the trouble is that so think that this is a fixed rate aircraft where it is flat. So the high pressure below the wing. I will be high pressure below the wing and low pressure above it. So at the edge of the like where the wing ends, uh, the air is actually trying to go above the wing from the sides instead of from the bottom. So that is actually causing a good amount of small resistance that we use. And uh, this is very painful. Uh, I mean, every time you do the vortex on the wing, you feel this image. So it's just like uh, you can see the boom of the air will actually be. Small number like that, just because the wing is finite and uh, the air is trying to release from the high pressure region to low pressure. Next is drilling is vortex G. So that being just the tip, but the pressure difference or the. Let me just try the line is going to be. So if this was, uh, say, a fixed wing aircraft and that was just. Uh, Think about this as a wing uh, you are seeing just going into the boat flat. Uh, a or, uh, so uh, the wing is actually flying inwards. So the lift distribution of this kind of wing will be something like uh, so it would be generating almost zero lift at the tip and some finite, and then it will kind of set it up and then it will go down the back. And as I was saying, that uh, it is the like high pressure here and low pressure there, so that the so air is like going to fall around. So that doesn't make sense. But even if it's simpler here, uh, there is difference in the list here, generated here, compared to, say, any neighboring point here. So you can think that there is high pressure here compared to here, and a low pressure here compared to here. So air is actually trying to move, and is actually trying to move like this, uh, in this direction here, and here it's trying to move like that. So it's also generating like a sheet of vertices, which is uh, displayed in this first image, like a vertices sheet. But that is for fixed room. Now if you go for rotor graph, the problem there is that this, as this thing is rotating, your field generation is not straight as this. It has to be something like that because the tip you your uh, something drops as usual. But here the lift generation is more outwards because your velocity is higher than if you remember. And so the, the other two vertices, like the training is vertex sheet, is opposite direction because the gradient is in the opposite direction. I'm showing you this because I will show you like, how it looks like when you actually do experiments and uh, see this with the IV. Let me do that. Then uh, in the vortex, there are different regions. So like, if you have a big vortex here, then you would have a region where there would be solid body pressure. Where there would be solid body pressure, and then after which you can kind of measure that would be a big pressure vortex. So uh, at lower end of the river, you expect that the horizontal rotation region will be bigger in size because the like, viscosity is actually trying to move everything with And at higher end of the river, that, that is going to be uh, smaller and the velocity increase might be higher and the inversive region will start soon. You can see the in uh, rotation region, which you see it's significantly reducing, it starts soon. 
So I, so one of my experiences being on poetry, poetry in a sense is to work as one of the other, uh, looking at opposite directions. Here, what you see is nothing but two saving friends, which are actually smartly designed for the modern. And these are some specifications, uh, which uh, so I think not for now. And uh, I'll go to the uh, Okay. So here in like, the time frame data, we are trying to show that how a cortex generated by a lower room which is advancing at this location. So here I'm showing that this is like, the rotor with a center in the middle. The wind is coming from the end. The lower rotor is uh, rotating in clockwise direction if you look from the So it's going like this, the clock rotor is going like that. So in the first image, which you cannot see, but um, so as the lower rotor is advancing, uh, it is reading stronger difficulties. And uh, after a few cycles, you will see the other, the, the blade, like uh, the top rotor blade would come by and actually interact with the vortex and uh, disturb it. So, okay, so for this particular image, I just did a smoke flow visualization with laser sheet. So I put the laser sheet at the location and took a video camera and looked at each and every single drop was um, Maybe you can uh, look at the slides, I can give you the slides for this interesting because it's not going to be Then, uh, it's just supposed to be a nice uh, rainbow. So, uh, these are PID events. So, in this case, uh, using <coughs> the better cameras, not just video camera, you are trying to find velocities uh, at different points. And I did that for three different advanced ratios. Like, advanced ratios is uh, wind speed divided by the tips. Uh, the tips. So that is basically like how fast is the thing So at lower advanced ratios, so this is at At lower advanced ratios, uh, you don't see much, but the vertex uh, seems to be like elongated or not really a cell. It's kind of uh, so, And as you uh, increase the advanced ratio, it becomes more of a cell. The explanation here, like very simple one. Is that as you increase the visual speed, or the advancing side plate is looking at a rate, high rate of speed compared to the repeating plate. Like the upper rotor is because it's coming away from the history. So it's not reading as bigger vortex. So if you have to you know, what is a, these are average uh, average values, these are like not extreme values. It's average over like one cycle of the whole uh, with both the rotors rotating at the same RP. The strength, uh, the difference in strength of vortices can be noticed at higher elevations. The rotor, uh, the tip vortex with the upper rotor is kind of very weak, so it is it does not affect the overall um, overall tip vortex between the lower rotor and so on. Everything all you see here is kind of just between the lower rotor. Next, I'll go on to something more interesting. Uh, we'll go on to it was actually bought from some coffee shop in this So here we are trying to study what happens between the two rotors when they are side by side. Uh, here I will show the laser plate was like that between the two rotors. And the wheels, uh, I did not do any um, fault like this, but this is. And uh, I did experiments with and without the gap around the rotors. Because uh, even the ducks actually significantly affect the field, which will be uh, seen in So, here is this configuration of this how I believe the part of the The just this image shows how uh, if it was there, uh, uh, it shows how the, uh, the particles look like in the laser shape. So, it's just the bomb. If you drop streamlines to the data, then you can check that. What would this be with this most useful plot? Which I will give you a probably more here. 
回去呗。So here you see uh, the case of validity archive. So I did experiments at two different archives to see if the Reynolds number or so what the rotors are shown. Are sharing vertices at uh, different sets of motion, which makes sense. Uh, the one on, on, on the right is causing uh, clockwise, and the one on the other side is uh, causing other clockwise vertices. But uh, as, you see, as you see, the image does not look very nice because there's a lot of other random vorticity in between. You can actually yeah, compare this when I show you the next one. So in this case, the RT is still the same, but now the only difference is that they have duct around the rotors. So each rotor is uh, covered with the duct, and because of that, the interactions between the two rotor vertices. As you do significantly, and now you see that uh, this works here and they survive longer compared to the previous things. Uh, as I showed in the first unit, we are looking at only two of the four rooms because you expect expect that everything is happening at a and uh, it's just a power case. So this will work. Now, if I go to the higher RPM case uh, without the rotor, uh, without the rotor. Here again, you will see the vertices are kind of clear compared to the low RPM case on the This is also that. But the difference here is that it is, as it is floating at high RPM and it's shifting both the first, it gets kind of less time. Uh, so the vertices get less, they are, get less time to interact with each other. And they are stronger in nature because as like more lift we generally are stronger it's the vortex. Like actually, it's more like. Uh, sharp is this variant more is the constraint of the vortex, but this is always going to be zero. So your brain is going to increase if you increase your RPM given the pitch of the order is much, which is two in this case. So the vertices is several longer and they kind of seem to interact less. Here, um, if you could see yeah, that these lines. The opposite direction lines which you see are the sharp edge and uh, the training at vortices, which I told you about in um, all the slides. Quite a good time for that was um, when you see the video. This also the dynamics of the of, uh, of those lines, and uh, they tend to like, move faster, like, kind of tilt down and go faster down for relative purposes. And uh, this is not very unusual because if you say there is a lot of downwash in the area directly below the rotor, and because of that, <coughs> the sharp edge or uh, uh, the training and vortices. Start travel down faster compared to the arctic vortex, which is kind of in a region where it is facing downwards with the rotor and is also seeing a stationary uh, flow. Field. So it's kind of in between. So, what is the effect of uh, the interactions? Like, uh, we talk about them being separate. Right. So, does it affect the performance of the I don't have uh, I have said that. 
So this was for conducted and conducted is, as you would expect, very nice, clean, and uh, it can just live longer and you'll see all the features very neat. So the only exception in all these four cases was the, the low RPM uh, unlimited case. And uh, you can also see you can also see the difference when you So <clears throat> the 1280 RPM case, you'll see the streamlines you can do four things. Kind of uh, very much very short distance. For the fifth case, they kind of diverge from each other. For the higher wave cases, they do not interact and they have coming to each other, observe each other, but they do not uh, interact very short distance. And for the fifth case, again like the uh, RPM case. Now the effect and performance is seen in this step. So, <clears throat> so we also measure thrust with like in all the four cases. And if you see like the other three cases have almost similar coefficient of thrust. Like uh, coefficient of thrust in non-dimensional form of uh, thrust because you cannot really compare when you have different uh, RPMs. So you can see that uh, the coefficient of thrust we have uh, in the different cases like Secretly off, if you consider the other three are very much similar to each other. So, yeah, you really do not want to have this kind of thing. So, the first one was Yeah. Also, so, so, we had a like, that uh, API nano Wilson. So, what are the first is we do all four of us. Now, uh, so, the first was measured on four of but as this was our case, so it is not a bad as if you do just divide the thrust by four, assuming that each rotor was uh, it's possible only one four of that. So, but it makes an effect only for at low RPM. Uh, so yeah, only at low RPM, we should also uh, say that at low horizontal. This was at high RPMs, they are separated by so exactly. So at high RPMs, uh, yeah, they do not interact easily. And, uh, in some of the videos, you can actually see that the sharp or the trading edge vertices, uh, like in the low RPM cases, they are responsible for breaking down the middle vertices and the, the, the tip vertices. They will interact and they like, just use it. Oh, but why does it result in an increase in thrust coefficient? Like, why does the interaction reduce at low RPM? What's the critique of this? So, like, on average, uh, I would say there are many, like, on average, many things happening uh, instantaneously, they are not really helping each other. So, if you, in this case, uh, <coughs> some of the velocity like, in the, uh, your, what you really care about is how much is your inflow and what's, what's the rotor speed, like, what is If the effective angle of attack or that reduces because there is some kind of force because of the interaction or a uh, down interaction. Then uh, your we have more induced drag or we'll see like x one determining the pressure because it's a fitting of the induced. So uh, for example if you have a pitch of say ten degrees this is ten degrees but there is some down wash uh to some some of the some of these effects. Then fifteen angle of attack can reduce from that to eight, seven, whatever it is, and then reduce from this. But uh, these things do not uh, these regions by themselves do not tell if it is uh, this was inefficient or not, because we do not have the proper things. Uh, what you really care about is your thrust to combination. Uh, I don't know how much that. Because uh, you could be looking at your uh, time. You can have some RPM, but you are kind of giving more torque for your condition. Though it is giving you more thrust, uh, it's not necessarily more condition. And uh, this I just want to what's next to be done. And uh, other configurations that you can study, like I did send this on the uh, question, but like we need to go down a smaller scale model to look at the low levels of the cases. As you saw that for lower levels of the the effects are significantly different. 
then uh, different levels of overlap of two locals is also is also of interest because um, one thing one thing to say is like if having two rotors side by side, you do not really want the one system to interact with each other. But then if you have some other configuration, it's possible that uh, you want to have the interactions, but that there has to be some that there might be some optimum, or if it's not like uh, so then other things is that this will be very um, chaotic flow of this. So that different levels they have this uh, the plates are going to like the down one should be the top one rotor in this case. Should be the upper rotor is going to affect the lower rotor plane and also what the tip rotor of the lower rotor does. So, we can only say it's going to benefit or it's going to reduce the performance. The other piece of concern are vibrations, noise, and all these things are going to study the aggregate dynamic. So, currently I'm building a setup for measuring so that I can measure just in. Uh, uh, on digital rotors and be able to do PID like seven days and be able to change the relative orientation of the two rotors. Um, and then I think this is this uh, artistic tendencies just to like see what you expect and to like I'm explain this for my proposal, this is a proposal, so it's still just proposals. I have to really find and see how it goes really well. That's all to it, and you know, see this demonstration.